fair in that analysis, not all of those 159 were organized into a single combat fleet, and more about that later. Uh, but for six months, the Japanese Imperial Navy had run rampant over not only the Pacific Ocean, but also into the Indian Ocean, where they pretty much took care of the Royal Navy uh, off both Ceylon and India, uh, and claiming for themselves uh, an aquatic empire that was not significantly smaller than about a third of the globe. And then in May of 1942, they made a decision to finish off what little was left of the United States Navy, in particular the combat striking element of the United States Navy, its aircraft carriers, uh, by targeting the Mid-Pacific Atoll of Midway. The idea here was not that Midway was important, it really wasn't to liberate those goonie birds that we saw in the movie. Uh, the idea was to lure the American carriers out of Pearl Harbor into deep water, where they could be sunk once and for all, giving the Japanese complete control of the Pacific as well as the Indian Ocean, and the time, therefore, needed to consolidate their conquests and create a defensive barrier that would prove impenetrable. It created, therefore, the notion that the action in Midway was a kind of a David versus Goliath confrontation. We obviously being David, the Japanese being Goliath, and both in Walter Ward's title and that of Gordon Frank, that suggestion is evident. And this uh, carving is on the wall of the World War II Memorial in Washington, D.C., which some of you, I hope, have had a chance to see. Um, they had no right to win, the passengers, but they did. And in so doing, they changed the course of the war. What Lord meant when he said that the Americans had no right to win was that the odds against them were so long that their ultimate triumph was virtually incomprehensible. That it was, in a word, incredible. And implicit in that assertion is the belief that the outcome of the Battle of Midway itself was, well, perhaps uh, luck, uh, fate, uh, chance, providence, however you may call it, history with a capital H. Um, 60 years after the battle, about 10 years ago, a website, uh, Midway 42, which you can still access online, uh, took uh, a survey among surviving veterans of the Battle of Midway, asking them who, in their view, was a critical player in bringing about this incredible, miraculous American victory at Midway. And a number of them answered, well, the answer is clear. It was God. That as in the days of the ancient Greeks, somehow the deity from the heavens came down onto mortal earth to decide the outcome of that battle. How else could you possibly explain such an uneven confrontation? Whatever your views on that score may be, um, the Battle of Midway was in fact not all luck or chance, or perhaps even province. It was, like most history, the product of individuals. The men were there, for the most part. There's a long list of them, and I could choose any one of a thousand, I suppose, easily enough. I guess you'd have to start with Yamamoto Soroku, the Japanese commander of the combined fleet, who made the decision to initiate this campaign in the first place. Uh, he virtually blackmailed uh, the Imperial Navy's general staff into approving his plan, threatening to resign if they didn't let him do it, uh, something that was intolerable. He was the great hero and champion after Pearl Harbor, and the government might have fallen had they not given him his way. There was, as I assume everyone in this room knows, uh, Joe Rochefort, the previously unsung and long underappreciated head of the team of cryptanalysts who cracked just enough of the Japanese operational code to forewarn the Americans of the approaching storm. There was Chester Nimitz. You know I'm not going to leave Chester Nimitz out of the list here, who with one carrier held together almost literally, but at least virtually, with scotch tape and bailing wire, that is the Yorktown, and two other previously untested carriers decided nevertheless that he would trust Rochefort's prediction and analysis and commit his fleet to accept the battle. 
And there are others, lots of others. Uh, the admirals like Fletcher and Sproats who command the American task forces, the captains of the ships, uh, plus Buckmaster and Mitcher and Murray, the commanders of the carriers. There were the pilots and the squadron commanders like McCluskey and Gray and Gallagher and Lindsay, many of whom uh, their jackets and their caps and their logbooks are in some of the displays in the George H. W. Bush gallery here. Uh, my wife and I just had a chance to go through that again, and I'm, I'm stunned as I always am by uh, how wonderful that collection is, and I will always present a little plug there for the museum. And there were individual pilots who happened to be in key spots or brought particular expertise to the confrontation. We saw Jimmy Thatch in the movie, uh, all for short, Leslie Massey, those who commanded the fighter and torpedo squadrons. All these men, hundreds of others, from ship drivers to plane pushers, made decisions, sometimes after long and careful thought, sometimes instantaneously in the blink of an eye, that had an impact on the outcome of this battle. At least one of them I know is in this room today, Lieutenant Commander Judson Brody, who is here at this table and was a member of Fighter Squadron VF-42 on Yorktown, and I would like to acknowledge him. His uh, colleagues helped me significantly uh, in the writing of my book on Midway with their uh, reminiscences of that conflict. Do we have any other Midway battle veterans in the room tonight, or today, this afternoon? There were men on the other side, uh, too, whose decisions uh, affected the outcome. I mentioned uh, Yamamoto already. Uh, there was uh, Tomonaga Juichi, who led that first strike, which we saw depicted in this film, that first attacked by 108 uh, bombers, fighters, and torpedo planes uh, who attacked Midway Island and almost got John Ford, um, and radioed back to the strike force that a second attack was going to be necessary, a decision that upset the entire timetable of the Japanese strike force. More about that, too. Mm -hmm. um, and of course, there's Nabuko Chuichi. Uh, who commanded that Japanese carrier strike force, who suffered through a horrible crisis of decision-making on the morning of June 4th. There, no decision he reached would have been the right one for him by that moment. He was just in an absolute conundrum. Incredible, I agree. Incredible the outcome may have been, but the Battle of Midway was not mystical, not particularly mysterious. It was the product of individual decisions by dedicated men and I will not dispute the assertion that there was luck involved. There's always luck, good or bad, involved in every military confrontation. How much to luck, how much to planning, how much to hard work, how much to determine performance. We can discuss all that during the Q&A here in a few minutes. But what I'd like to do with the rest of my time here is talk about four of these men. I could just as easily pick four others, or 20 others, but then we, we do want to have time for our conversation. So, given where we are today, it's only natural for me to begin with, who else? Chester Nimitz, the Admiral from the Hill Country. He's not only our metaphorical host here today, but the man on whom all else depended. I see him virtually every day, uh, the library at the Naval Academy, Nimitz Library, is named for him. There's a bust of him by Felix de Walden in the foyer of that building. I think this is probably a good role model as we can put in front of our midshipmen as they go in, hopefully at least once a week, into the library. <laughs> Although these days, uh, you know, you have to tell a student, this is a book, it works like this. <laughs> Does it have a keyboard? Um, I have another naval message, by the way, which I brought to share with you today, particularly because of where we are and because of this. This is another naval message that I found in the bathroom files at FDR Library in High Park. This was uh, from SYNCPAC, we now know, of course, as Nimitz, uh, to Cole R. Stevenson. Any diehard Texas politicians in here know who Cole Stevenson was? Governor of Texas. 
The officers and men of the Pacific Fleet are now engaged in the tremendous task before them, fully aware of the power and resourcefulness of the enemy. Stop. The spirit displayed by all Texans in actual conflict with the enemy and in their response to the Navy's call for volunteers is an inspiration to the fleet and the nation and a source of great pride to me. Stop. Deeply sensible the honor accorded me by the state of Texas, I consider it a tribute to all Texans in the fleet, Admiral Nimitz. So there you go, Texans. Thanks for winning the three. I don't know who the other guy over here. Nimitz was not a flashy leader. He was not Patton. He was not Halsey. He was almost the opposite of that. The normal reserve that he displayed, particularly in moments of crisis, led people to think maybe he wasn't even paying attention. It had earned him a reputation as cold or unemotion. In fact, he was neither of those things. He was just not particularly demonstrative. He was able to maintain that calm demeanor under all kinds of pressure. There's a story that I do tell in the book, but which I'll tell again, because I do think it reflects so clearly on who he was and the way he commanded. Back in the 1930s, when he was commanding the Asian squadron, his flagship was the old USS Augusta, a big heavy gun cruiser. Um, and it was coming into port one day, and he gave the con to the junior officer of the deck that day, an ensign named O.D. Waters. And given his last name, he was inevitably nicknamed Muddy. <laughs> Muddy Waters. Told him of uh, Ensign Waters bring the ship to anchor. Gulp. Aye, uh, sir. Well, obviously nervous with the, you know, the Admiral's eye on him. You know, he brought the ship a little too fast, you know, not enough reverse, but paid out too much anchor chain. Finally got the thing under control, and the ship was stopped in more or less the right place. But the ensign was sweating bullets by then, and uh, he looked up at Nimitz to see what the reaction would be, and Nimitz said, Waters, you know what you did wrong, don't you? Waters responded, yes, sir, I certainly do. George Newman's reply, that's fine, carry on. <laughs> and I think that story says a lot about it. All during that time, Newman just stood there, didn't say a word, didn't intervene. What are you doing? That's wrong. Don't do it that way. He watched. And it was all done. Did you learn something from that? Yes, sir. Carry on. Uh, I told this story once at another venue, um, oh, six, eight months ago or so. And afterward, an uh, individual came rushing up to the podium to tell me he was Muddy Waters' son-in-law. <laughs> and that on his, uh, when he first was brought home by his uh, brand new wife to meet the folks at dinner that night, his new father not told that story. He said he already told it every week for the rest of his life. <laughs> <laughs> so I know it's true. <laughs> uh, that story implies a lot about Nimitz as a kind of seagoing stoic, but that's only partly true. He wasn't um, lacking in emotion. He merely kept those emotions under control. Uh, and he would need to do so uh, for the next six months or so in particular. When Nimitz took over as St. Pat, Commander Chief Pacific, three weeks after Pearl Harbor, he knew he had very limited resources. He had four aircraft carriers reduced to three only 10 days later when the Saratoga was torpedoed by a Japanese submarine. So from four down to three, a 25% reduction in available offensive capability in the first 10 days. But then it was increased back up again to four when the brand new construction USS Hornet through the canal up to San Diego and across the ocean reported to the Pacific Theater. He had a handful of cruisers, that survived the Pearl Harbor strike, a few destroyer divisions, and the submarines. The problem with the submarines, of course, is that the torpedoes didn't work, although nobody quite knew that for sure in early 1942. What he did know was that no fewer than 13 brand new, much larger Essex-class aircraft carriers would be coming off the building ways in about 14 months, maybe 12 to 14 months. And their appearance would give the United States not only superiority over the Japanese, but overwhelming superiority. Until then, however, he would have to make do with what he had. And in particular, he would need to conserve his most precious resource, those four 
aircraft carriers. In addition, Nimitz knew that the blueprint for America's strategic planning in the Pacific called for making Germany the primary target. Germany had a, a GDP, we would call it today, gross domestic product, an economy nearly three times that of the Japanese. They were already the masters of most of Europe, deep inside the Soviet Union, threatening to push Britain over the edge. The defeat of Germany had to take highest priority, and he knew that was official United States policy. And therefore, the US forces in the Pacific, his theater, were expected to remain on the defensive. Don't risk those few scarce resources that you have. Now, to be sure, the CNO and Comish, the crusty, difficult, obstreperous Ernest J. King, insisted that this be what he called an active defense, one that included frequent raids to keep the enemy off balance, back on his heels, and so on. But the practical impact of this strategic blueprint on Nimitz's own decision making was that he knew he could not expect any reinforcements or backup from the Atlantic, no new construction main uh, battle platforms, carriers, for at least 14 months. And one final thing inhibited Nimitz's flexibility and freedom of movement in that unhappy spring of 1942. In April, in an operation that was directed from Washington, Nimitz had to commit half of his striking force, two of his four carriers, to the Doolittle Raid, a raid that Nimitz secretly believed to be not much more than a public relations stunt. And simultaneously, he had to send his only other two carriers into the Coral Sea to blunt a Japanese drive on Fort Moresby. Those two carriers were to halt the Japanese offensive, which they did successfully, but at a great cost. The big American carrier Lexington was sunk in the Yorktown, badly crippled. Thus, by the end of May, when Nimitz learned about the pending Japanese attack on Midway, he had no carriers at all immediately to hand. Two were on their way back from the Doolittle Raid. One of them had been sunk, and one was limping back under its own power, but trailing a 10-mile oil slick behind it, and unlikely to be able to participate in another battle anytime soon, if at all. So given all of that, scarce resources, a strategic plan that ordered him to remain on the defensive, the weakening of his few available offensive platforms, what should he do about the forthcoming Japanese thrust at Midway? A more cautious man might have decided to preserve and protect the crippled Yorktown and to conserve the only two fully operational carriers he had left, Hornet and Enterprise, keeping them in port, or perhaps even better, sending them eastward, back toward the west coast of the United States, out of harm's way. Surely those two carriers were more valuable to the American war effort than the tiny two-island atoll of Midway with its Goody birds. I thought Ford spent a little too much time, by the way, in the Goonie birds. <laughs> if he had done that, then he could have waited for the Saratoga undergoing repairs at the Bremerton Navy Yard in Washington to return. As it turns out, it returned only two days after the Battle of Midway. Anyway, he'd have gotten that back. He could have repaired the York, and then he'd have four carriers again, and he could get Midway back. Right? Now, to be sure, the Japanese might hold it for a while, but they'd have a hard time keeping it at the end of a 3,000-mile supply line from Tokyo. So maybe the smart thing to do, certainly the conservative thing to do, would have been to say, well, we know they're coming. Let's get out of the way. Let's preserve and protect those scarce resources. We'll act as a strategic blueprint dictates on the defensive. Was Midway that tiny outpost of sand and coral, and of course, Goody Birds, was that worth risking those few carriers? Nimitz thought it was. He believed he could repair the Yorktown quicker than the experts said they could, which would give him three 
which plus that airfield on Eastern Island you see on the screen there, gave him four airplane platforms. And if it's true that yeah. that airfield can't maneuver, it also can't sink. So instead of being surprised by the Japanese, as had happened six months before at Pearl Harbor, he would surprise them and send at least some of their carriers to the bottom. This was, in his mind, not a gamble. He did not throw the dice without thinking about it. Behind those cool blue eyes was the calculating mind of a man who weighed the odds carefully and planned accordingly. Despite Walter Lord's famous line that they had no right to win, Nimitz fully expected to win. Of course, one reason he had that expectation was because he had an ace in the hole. And this brings us to our second man I want to talk about today. There he is. This is the photo everybody uses of Joe Rochefort. And I think the reason is because artistically, you can see him kind of hiding in the shadows. You see that? Shadow comes down over his eye. He's the cryptonist in the darkened, subterranean dungeon breaking Japanese coat. Rochefort was the head of station hypo, as it was called, um, the crypt analysis unit in Hawaii. Uh, you know, the contributions that he and his team made uh, were ignored because, at least popularly, because they were classified. I mean, obviously, you couldn't let the Japanese know that we'd broken their code. They'd adjust, and we'd lose that source of information. So that had to get, be kept secret. But even after the role was, uh, of crypt analyst was declassified in the 1970s, Rochefort remained a somewhat shadowy figure, hence the shadows in the photo. There's a new biography out of him. Uh, I noticed there's a copy of it in the bookstore next door uh, by Elliot Carlson that has lifted a certain amount of the shadows from this gifted but also touchy and difficult individual. You know, crypt analysts are that way naturally. And if there are some of you in the room, I apologize in advance, but you know you are. <laughs> The story of code breaking uh, that is intrinsic to the history of the Battle of Midway, I was hoping Matt, Shout and Matt, Matt Showers would be here today. I know he planned to come and had some health problems at the end. You can see uh, him talking about the code breaking in one of the venues in the museum. But Mac, uh, who also helped me with my book uh, when I was working on it, uh, is a, was a young ensign and knew Joe Rocher and was a participant in all of that. Uh, long secret, the role of the code breakers is now pretty well known, but ironically, the declassification of that role uh, swung interpretation almost 180 degrees the other way, saying, well, we didn't know anything. And they surprised us by coming out of the clouds, only spotted them with the long-range PBY Catalinas. Now, all of a sudden, the new interpretation was we knew everything. We knew it all. We knew the first names and the uh, first wives of every sailor on every ship and all. That's not true either. Rochefort and his team certainly deserved their spot in the historical record, and Rochefort obviously deserved the National Defense Service Medal that was finally and much belatedly awarded to him by President Reagan in 1986. But, but we must also be careful not to exaggerate what it was the code breakers had been able to do. After all, if we knew everything about the Japanese plan, then the courageous decision by Nimitz seems a foregone conclusion. Of course he would decide to resist the Japanese. He knew all about it. No, he didn't. Let's look at what the Americans did know in 1942. First of all, it's important to know that only about 60% of all the messages the Americans intercepted could be subjected to analysis at all because there were so many of them. There were 500 to 1,000 of them every day. And breaking them took so much time that only a handful of those could be analyzed. Of those that were analyzed, fewer than half yielded any information. And within those few, only small fragments, less than 10%, might be rendered comprehensible. Often the code breakers at HIPO could determine the sender and the recipient and one or two other phrases. I, I was going through the decrypts, the actual version of decrypts of these, which is in the, the Leighton papers at the Naval War College in Newport. And I found this one. It's pretty typical. This is from May 5th, 1942. This is one of the 
naval messages that allowed us to figure out what the Japanese were doing, see how much you can get from it. Kaga, that's the name of a Japanese carrier. Kaga and blank, blank, plus blank, blank, will depart, blank, 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 May 4th, and blank, blank, blank. There you go. Smoking gun, now we know. It was Roche's first job and those who worked for him and with him to use their intuition, their imagination, their memory in particular. Wait a minute, I saw something about this 200 messages ago. Let me find that. To fill in all those blanks. To say then that the Americans were reading the Japanese code is simply not true. After much hard work, sometimes 24 hours a day, they might, in the end, be able to decipher a tiny fraction of it. And they had to rely on their experience, their intuition, informed guesswork to determine what that meant, and then to brief Admiral Nimitz, this is what we think. Not what we know, it's what we think. And based on that kind of data, Rochefort advised Nimitz the Japanese were likely to attack Midway Atoll with four, maybe five, Japanese carriers, that they would do so around the last week of May, 1942. Not everybody believed it. Captain John Redman, who as the head of the code and signal station in Washington was Rochefort's boss, thought that the Japanese were going to go after the West Coast, Washington, California, maybe attack the supply line between Hawaii and Australia at uh, New Caledonia. Redmond's skepticism fed the doubts of his boss, Chief of Naval Operations and Plumage, Ernest J. King, that you can't trust this guy Rochefort. He's kind of squirrely, you know. Rochefort was annoyed, naturally enough, to have the results of his team's hard work challenged by brass in Washington. Some of you may have heard the story, perhaps the most famous story of the battle, of how Rochefort had one of his men send a message and the subterranean cable out to Midway saying, tell us you're running out of water. Tell us a distiller. Salt water distiller is broken down. You don't have enough salt water. And then we'll see how the Japanese react to that. And when the Japanese intercepted the message and reported that AF was short of drinking water, it proved what Rochefort had been saying all along, that AF in this message traffic was a specific reference to Midway. Rochefort knew that all along, that the mythology of that story, the story is true, but the mythology is that Rochefort did it to find out from it. No, no, he knew already. He was positive. This was to prove to Redmond and the king that it was Midway. And they went, oh, okay, we believe you now. There's one more side note to this story that I particularly enjoy. And that is that among the scores of these 159 Imperial Japanese Navy ships headed for Midway in that uh, busy month, uh, one of them was a, a transport, a maru in Japanese terminology, that carried two new distillers to replace the broken one on Midway. <laughs> <laughs> Nimitz's first critical decision was to trust Rochefort's analysis. And as a result of that, he ordered the Yorktown rushed into dry dock as soon as it arrived on May 27, and that repairs that some estimated would take six months had to be completed in no less than three days. I mean, you get these orders from admirals, you know, and say, well, let's take about six months, Admiral. Fine, I need it in three days. Aye, aye, sir. What, you know, what else can you say? Surely some of the unsung heroes of the Battle of Midway were the yard workers who labored in three shifts, around the clock, to get that work done. They labored all night. They put a big arc lights on the dock so they could work right through the night, even though there was a blackout in Honolulu, just down the coastline. The big arc lights were burning at the Navy Yard all night long. Then the Yorktown shattered air group had to be reinforced by pilots and planes from the still absent Saratoga, which is how DF-42 ended up being on the Yorktown in the first place. So with a patched up ship and a patched up air group, the Yorktown put to sea in time to rendezvous with Nemesis' two healthy carriers to a predetermined point 325 miles north of Midway, codenamed Point Luck. So that's two individuals. 
who, had they made different decisions, and could easily have made different decisions, affected both the trajectory and the outcome of the Battle of Midway. Here's a guy who found himself really at point zero, I guess, on that day. This is Nagumo Chuichiya. I think this photograph, too, is a, kind of an artistic statement. He looks a little bit perplexed to me, like, uh, what's going on? What's happening to me? I certainly felt that way on June 4th. He was the commander of the four carrier task group known in Japanese as the Kidobutai, the Fast Attack Mobile Strike Force. Uh, he had commanded that force in the attack on Pearl Harbor six months before. In fact, he commanded six carriers then, but two of those, as we know, uh, had been weakened at the Battle of the Coral Sea and had been sent back for repair. The Japanese could have done what the Americans did, jury rig repairs, got them out to sea in a hurry to participate in this combat, but they didn't think it was necessary. Um, nothing, after all, has stood up to the Kido Butai so far in this war, not in the Pacific, not in the Indian Ocean. There was no reason to think anything would do so now. This assumption has a name. It's victory disease. Things go well. You assume they're going to keep going well. You assume that what has happened in the past will continue to befall you in the future. We will always win because we always have a useful cautionary tale. It's important to remember that despite the overwhelming numerical advantage possessed by the Japanese and the total number of ships, those 159 warships were spread out over half the Pacific Ocean. Yamamoto himself was at sea in the super battleship Yamato, several hundred miles behind the Kido Butai, well beyond supporting distance, as was the invasion force of two battleships, seven cruisers and transports and support ships under Admiral Kondo. In effect, the real fight, the fight that mattered, the fight that would decide the outcome of the battle would be between the three American carriers and their escorts, 26 ships, and the Gumo's Kido Butai, which consists of four carriers, two heavy cruisers, two battle cruisers, one light cruiser, and 12 destroyers, 21 ships. So all of a sudden, that David and Goliath confrontation has been narrowed significantly. This looks like a fairly even fight. Despite all that, Nagumo, who was a warrior by nature, as I think also shows in his portrait, was not worried about the confrontation with the American surface force. He believed that both the Lexington and the Yorktown had been sunk at the Coral Sea, and that the Saratoga, too, had gone to the bottom. So he expected that the Americans had no more than two carriers, maybe three. They didn't know where the Wasp was, for sure. His first indication that something might go wrong came at 7.30 on the morning of June 4th, when the attack planes from that first wave, which we saw pasting midway, were coming back to the carrier force. When they were returning, he got a, a message from a scout plane that American surface forces had been sighted. Well, Tomonaga had already radioed in, you know, a second strike force on the island would be necessary. We did not eliminate the offensive potential of Midway Island. We're going to have to hit it again. Gumo had half of his planes in reserve, sent out 108 for the first strike, he kept 108 on deck. They're there in case any carriers are spotted. Nope, no carriers around, okay. Well, there are two ways to handle this. You can sympathize with the situation. You've got 108 coming back. You could put those first 108 down below, recover the first wave, refuel, rearm, and send them back out again, keeping half your force doing nothing down there playing dominoes or whatever, on the hangar deck, or while these guys are coming back, you can ready this group, send them out, recover the first group, and come on shuttle much more efficient. Let's do that. So take the bombs off the 108 airplanes on our ships now, replace them with fragmentary bombs for shore attack, and we'll just switch when they come. And in the midst of this, he gets a report from the scout plane enemy surface forces spotted 100 miles to the north. To the north? What are they doing there? 
And listen to the report. Ten ships, apparently enemy sighted. Well, what kind of ships are they? Ascertain ship types, Nugumo asks him. Meanwhile, he says, everybody stop. Just hold it. Stop taking those bombs off. Stop bringing up the bombs from the magazine. We don't know what you've got here yet. So 10 minutes goes by. 10 minutes. 745. Enemy ships are five cruisers and five destroyers. No carriers. But you've got to think, well, what are five cruisers and five destroyers doing out in the middle of the North Pacific anyway? They would not be there if there were not a carrier in the vicinity. He and his staff had to assume there must be a carrier nearby, and they're only 100 miles away. They're already within strike range. Well, we can deal with that later. Meanwhile, he continues changing out the ordinance. Now, maybe this is the first questionable decision that Nagumo makes that morning, but it's not his last. While they're doing that, his ships come under attack from torpedo planes. First, from Midway Island. You know, 96 airplanes attack the Japanese from the island. The decisive attack would come from the carrier, to be sure. But the initial attacks came from the island itself. And the Americans were wiped out. Absolutely wiped out. Almost to a man. You know, Fieberling, six Avengers, only five, only one got back, and it was so shot up, they had to scrap it. Most of the Army bombers that we saw taking off in the film, they, they dropped from 20,000 feet. Well, we were lucky you could hit the ocean from there. We certainly didn't hit any Japanese vessels. But everybody else is just devastated. And one thing that we've learned from that is you don't send out a strike force without fighter cover. There's a strike force without fighter cover sitting up. Look what we just did to the Americans. But it did have this effect. It delayed the transfer of ordinance 